Hey, good morning. morning. Hey, it's great to see you guys. Thanks so much for being here with us. I would have just come back to this service. I've been to all the services. I was here for a rehearsal. I'd have come back just for the music. That's how good it was. Can you help me say thank you to these guys? Yeah. It's good, good messages there. Hey, if you're online, thanks for being here with us. Uh, Today we are in our second week of a series that we're doing on Ruth. And it is an absolutely fascinating series. Like I would tell you that Ruth is one of the most fascinating books in the entire Old Testament. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. If you look at Ruth, if you were to read all of them, and I was going to ask you the question, hey, did something not fit here? Does something not, like, if you just looked at it and took it at face value, does something not fit? You would have to look at me and say, you know, there's something peculiar about Ruth. And the reason that she's so amazing and the reason that she stands out is she's a Gentile, meaning she's not Jewish. And so if you're not Jewish, that makes you a Gentile. And what makes it so fascinating is, is if you go through and look at that period of history, God is a God of the Hebrews. He's a God of the Israelites. And the the thing that's missing is like the Gentiles. Like he's establishing who he is through a nation And yet you've got a Gentile woman in a book dedicated to her, and you're like, what on earth is she doing there? And so I just kind of want to talk about what Ruth's doing there for just a few minutes, because Ruth's presence during this period of time is telling us something. And what it's telling us is, is that from the beginning, God was thinking about you. God's thinking about me. He's thinking about us. You see, if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, we've all heard the story of Adam and Eve. And we've all heard of the original sin when they, when they took the fruit that they weren't supposed to take, where they disobeyed God. And right after that, God is having a conversation with Adam and Eve and the serpent, a.k.a. Satan. And he looks at them and he looks at the serpent and he says, I will put enmity between her offspring and you. And you will get a chance to strike his heel. But he will deliver the death blow and he will crush your head. Who is God talking about in Genesis chapter three? He's talking about Jesus. God is talking that, hey, sin just entered the world, but something bigger and bigger better that it's going to be for all people is on its way. And throughout the Old Testament, God just dropping clues and something bigger and better is coming. And if you were to just fast forward 17 chapters to Genesis chapter 20, God is having a conversation with a guy that we know is Abraham. And he has a conversation. He says, Abraham, I'm going to build a nation through you. And through your life, through your offspring, Abraham, I am going to bless all nations. Well, if you look at the Old Testament, God is a God of the Hebrew nations, but in Genesis chapter 17, he's like, yeah, but my plan's bigger than this, for I'm going to bless all nations, including not Jewish people, including Gentiles, and that's why Ruth is there, because she is a Gentile, And she's just fitting into God's greater narrative that tells us he was always thinking about you. He was always planning on us being a part of God is that good. And that's why we're looking at Ruth. Because if you look at Ruth, Ruth is a foreshadowing that we're going to be included, just Gentiles be included in God's plan. Ruth, in the story of Ruth, we see foreshadowings of Jesus. And we get to see through Ruth as when we get to chapter 4, we're going to actually get to see that it's actually through Ruth that Jesus comes. I mean, she's a part of the Christmas story, which is why we're looking at this. Last week, we started in chapter one. And if you remember, I told you last week that Ruth is a redemptive story. And what do all redemptive stories have in common? They start off feeling like... And that's exactly what happens in chapter one. 
like Elimelech, this God-fearing man, this, this, this Jew, this God-fearing Hebrew person who knows what it is to obey God, does what is right in his own eyes, and he moves to a foreign land, like big time no-no. And he moves to a foreign land, he stays longer than he should have stayed, and there's implications all over the place, and he dies there, and he leaves his family worse off than, than what they were before when there was a famine in the land. And we get just this kind of like, woe is me, because now Naomi doesn't have a husband, and Elimelech's sons die, and now Ruth doesn't have a husband, and they're women, and it just feels awful, like, man, there's no future for them whatsoever. That's what a redemptive story feels like. There's no hope. But you also know in a redemptive story that in order for it to be redemptive, at some point we have to feel good about it. And there's four chapters in Ruth. And I know that we stepped off and it didn't feel good. But what I want to let you know is that today in chapter two, hope is coming. And I've entitled this message today, Hope Rises. And let me just tell you a few principles about hope. There's a few universal principles about hope. Hope is future-oriented. Man, when you have hope, you look forward to the future. When you have hope, hope is life-giving. You're excited about the future. You, you're pumped about it. And the last thing that hope is, is hope is contagious. It never impacts and influences just us. When we're hopeful, we turn into chatterboxes. And we want to share that with other people about the hope that we have. But in Ruth chapter 1, Naomi and Ruth, they have no hope of a future. In Ruth chapter 1, man, there is nothing life-giving about anything that they're experiencing. In fact, it is so bad for them that Naomi identifies herself with grief. She says, don't call me Naomi because that means pleasant. Call me Mara for I am bitter because that's what Mara means. There's nothing life-giving about her circumstances. She, when we left her, she's got one foot in the grave. And there was nothing contagious about their life that was appealing. In fact, if they had anything that was contagious, it was grief. And when somebody is just grieving, what do we do? We avoid them because we don't want them to bring us down. And we see that kind of happening at the end of Ruth chapter 1. They, they've arrived home to a big welcome and Naomi is just like, you know, I'm bitter and people just kind of disappear. But what I would tell you is hope is coming. And so if you wouldn't mind, please turn with me now to Ruth chapter 2. And what we'll do is we'll read through the story, we'll look at the narrative, and then we'll see what God has in store for us as hope rises through, uh, through the story of Ruth. And as, as I share with this, we call this story, which we should, because it's an absolutely fascinating story while you turn there, a absolutely fascinating story. But remember, Ruth is a real person living in real time, dealing with real issues. What you're about to read is historically accurate. It actually happened. And so don't just look at this as like a fun bedtime story. This is real history. It happened. If you're having a hard time finding Ruth, she is near the front of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, awesome. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. There we go. Hey, good job, you guys. All right, Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech. He was a man of standing whose name was? Now Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, all right, hey, I'm going to go to the fields and I'm going to pick leftover grain behind anybody in whose eyes I find favor. She was basically going to get up, go to a field, and she was going to go eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Naomi said to her, that sounds like a great plan. You should go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth goes out. Uh, she goes out, and she begins to glean in the field behind the harvesters. As it turns out, she found herself working in the field belonging to? What are the chances? Who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrives from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, hey, whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, she is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. 
She said, please, let me, glean in the, let, me, let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. So she went into the field and worked steadily from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So then we clearly see Boaz goes from asking about Ruth to speaking to her, because in verse 8 we see that Boaz says to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me, don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Please stay, stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I've told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go get a drink from the water, water jars and the men, that the men have filled. At this, Ruth bows down with her face to the ground. And she exclaims, why? Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you would notice me? A foreigner. And Boaz looks at her and he replies, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother in law since the death of your husband and how you left your father and your mother and your homeland to come and live with the people you did not know before. And then Boaz says, May the Lord repay you for what you have done, and may you richly be rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort, and you have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. And at mealtime, Boaz says to her, hey, why don't you come on over here and have some bread, dip it into the wine and vinegar. When Ruth sat down with her harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. Ruth ate all that she wanted and had some left over. And as she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, even if she gathers among the sheaves, do not embarrass her. Rather, pull out some of the stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. And do not rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until the evening, and then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over from lunch that she had not eaten. Her mother-in-law asked Ruth, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you, Ruth. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is... The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, for he has not stopped showing kindness to the living and the dead. And she added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. That word kinsman redeemer doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but it meant a whole lot to Ruth and Naomi, and we'll talk about that in the days and weeks to come. Then Ruth the Moabitess adds on to that and said, he even said to me that I can stay with the workers until they finish harvesting all the grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughters, to go with his girls because in somebody else's field, you might be. Okay, those aren't thoughts that we typically think are okay to have in church, but here's what I would tell you. It is very dangerous for Ruth to be in some of these fields because the men may not be very respectful to her. And so allow your imagination to run wild with that for a minute. And that's what's staring Ruth in the face by just being in the fields. And so that's why you understand what the offer that Boaz is making her is just unbelievable. It's just awesome. It's too good to be true. So uh, she won't be harmed. Verse 23. Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean the barley and the wheat harvest until they were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law, Naomi. All right. So in chapter one, we end with despair. But by the time we get to the end of chapter two, we see that hope is rising. Like Ruth and Naomi now have a future. Like there's comfort, there's peace, there's provision, there's security. Whoa. Man, they have a future. Looks like hope's rising. Not only is there a future, but it's life-giving. They've got something to look forward to. They've been provided for. It's like, wow, can you believe this? And the last thing that we see is we see that hope is contagious. The last time we talked to Naomi in chapter one, she's like, God has cursed me. And now in round in verse 20, she's saying, wow, the Lord bless, bless um, Boaz. Man, what are we seeing here? We're seeing hope. 
How on earth did we go from despair to hope? Well, there's a couple things that happen, and it actually starts back in verse 1. Or sorry, it starts back in chapter 1, where Ruth decided to make Naomi's God her God. The situation didn't change, but that tiny decision is going to lead to the big dividend of hope. That's where it started. The second thing that led to hope for her is she got up and she went out to glean in the fields. Ruth decided to get up and go do something about her situation, which was to go out in the fields. And from a historical context, this is huge. Because long before Ruth needed to be in that field, long before, if you're wondering, like, why is Ruth even going out to the field, is because that was God's plan. You see, God had instituted a law long before that the rich, the people of standing, the men of standing who own fields were never meant to keep everything for themselves. In fact, they were supposed to leave some in the field so that the poor would be provided for. The poor knew that they could go into the field and they could glean from, that there would be some left over for them. So when we read in Ruth chapter 2 that she's going out to the field, she's going out there because she knows God has made a way to provide for their circumstances. She knows that there's going to be food there, so she simply gets up and goes to the field. But if you look at chapter, chapter 2 verse 1, it, there's this foreshadowing like, man, it, and what is it? it says, now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was and Ruth gets up and she says, I'm just going to go to a field today and maybe I'll find favor there. She's going to go eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Let me tell you something. When Ruth got up and when she left, I promise you, Boaz's field was not the first one she came to. She probably passed several fields, but she wound up in whose field? She wound up in Boaz's field. What are the chances? We say that all the time. If you were to just look at that part of the story, if you were to just take it at surface, surface glance, you'd be like, that's a crazy coincidence. Like, man, Ruth is really lucky. And we do that. I do that all the time. In fact, I remember somebody telling me a story. I was just a part of a group, and somebody was telling me a story how they were going on the back roads of Wyoming. They were just exploring this beautiful land that God made uh, called Wyoming. And as they're back there, they're awesome. They're soaking it all in. It's absolutely fantastic until it wasn't. You see, they never, they were taking in the beauty, but they stopped taking in their fuel gauge. And when they stopped taking in their fuel gauge, they wound up in the middle of nowhere with no gasoline, and their car wouldn't run anymore. They're completely stranded 40 miles from the closest gas station. But all of a sudden, they look out their front windshield, true story, and they see a rancher, a rancher who stops by, picks them up, takes them to their, his place, puts fuel in their car so that they can make it home safely. What are the chances? That's an amazing coincidence. You look at Ruth and you're like, what are the chances? No way. I don't call that coincidence. I call that providence, which is a really big way and really big word of saying that God's hands were in Ruth's steps that day. God's hands were in Ruth's steps. God knew that Ruth would go to a field. He knew that he, she was going to go to a field, but God's hands were in Ruth's steps that day, and he got her exactly where he needed her to be. That's amazing. But here's where this all comes home for you and me. I want to remind you that Ruth is a Gentile. She's not a Jew, but she made a decision to make their God her God. And she made a decision to get up and to take her everyday ordinary life, her sleeping, her eating, her going to work, her ordinary life, just the next step, and she placed it before God as, a, sounds like Romans 12, 1 and 2 to me, and God got Ruth where he needed her to be. And if God would do that for her, do you know what I believe he'll do for us? God will get you where he needs you to be. You see, 
somebody showed up this morning and you don't like Ruth, you don't like your circumstances. You're trying to fast track your way through these circumstances. In fact, you're pretty convinced that God isn't getting you where you need to be. In fact, you're pretty convinced that your idea is better than his idea. And you're striving and you're working your tail off. Do you want to know how I know that? Because that's what I do. I try to always think that where I should be is where God really is trying to get me. But what I want to tell you is, is that he's God and you're not. He's God and I'm not. And if he can get Ruth where he needs her to be, then he can get you where he needs you to be. And here's the good news about that. You can stop striving right now. And you can just take your everyday ordinary life and do what comes next and say, God, here it is as an offering, and you can rest, you can trust that he is going to get you where you need to be. He's going to get you in front of the people that you need to be in front of. He's going to get you to the help that you need to be. Your job in that is to just say, okay, Lord, here's my day. I'll follow you. This is what I've got to do, and I'm going to trust that you are going to get me where you need me, need me to be. That is amazing freedom in that. And here's the best part. That was just for the Christian folk. Now, I hope that there is somebody in this place that is skeptical about God. I hope that there is somebody here today that may not believe in God the way that some of the people in here do. In fact, I hope that you have friends who are distant from God and that you would bring them here. Because in this moment, in this story, we see the fullness of God's love because I want to remind you of who Ruth is. She is a Moabite woman. She is a Gentile, and yet God is working for her good. And so this morning, if you showed up, and you're not sure what you believe, but you got here anyway, what I would tell you is there is not one detail of your life that God is not interested in. And he will use the good and he'll use the bad. He'll use all of it to show you how good he is. And so if you're far from him today, this is awesome that you're here because you're seeing that God is using somebody who doesn't really know the fullness of who he is, doesn't really know how to fully relate to him, and yet God is aware of her and he works for, for her good and his glory that somebody who was far from him would know him and how good he is. And if he would do that for Ruth, he will do that for you. And now if I just bring everybody back into this, regardless of where you're at with Jesus, there has never been a moment that God's love for you hasn't burned red hot. He is nev his love for you has never been more fervent than it is right now. And tomorrow, should tomorrow come and you would wake up and you would see and experience the day, God's love for you in that moment will never be more fervent than it is in that moment. And if God could get Ruth where he needed her to be, God can get you where he needs you to be. And so I want you to think about those circumstances you came in with. And if you're unhappy with, if you're not excited about where they're at, God's just leading you to the place that he wants you to be. Your job is, is to just look around and see his goodness. Because in verse four through eight, verse four through eight, hope, and what I would tell you is hope rises for Ruth. The reason hope rises is in the chapter is because God gets her where he needs her to be. That's the first reason hope rises. Now let me give you the second. If you looked at verse 4 through 8, if we made Ruth chapter 2 verses 4 through 8, if Hollywood made it a movie, we would all be on the edge of our seat. They would put some music involved in there, and if we were in a theater together, we would all be leaning in saying, what is about to happen? Because it all hangs in the balance on verses four through eight. Ruth has been in the field. She has been working. Everything's going better than she could have imagined. And she looks up and someone is there that is new. And it's the owner of the field. And she looks up and she sees the owner of the field talking to the foreman of the field. And they're all looking at her. 
And then we see in verses four through eight that Boaz goes from asking who she is to actually talking to her. So let me tell you what happened. Ruth looks up, sees the owner of the field, and she knows she doesn't belong. She knows she's a foreigner. She knows she doesn't have the standing of a slave. That's how low she is on the totem pole, that a slave has more rights than what she has being in that field. And the next thing she sees is the foreman is walking across the field towards her, and she's thinking to herself, this doesn't look good. It would be like you showing up for work, and you know and the, it'd be like you showing up for work and the boss says, hey, today at 3.30, I want to talk with you. But they don't tell you why. But you have just enough information to know, ah, this might not look so good because you've been mistreating coworkers and you've been mistreating customers and you've been skipping meetings. And you're thinking, when the boss says he's going to talk to me and 3.30 starts getting closer, you start feeling anxiety because you have just enough information to know this doesn't look good. Only when you show up to the meeting, rather than tell you how you've been underperforming, the boss goes and gives you a promotion. That's unbelievable. It's it's unexpected. It, it's like so far-fetched. It is too good to be true. So now let's go back to the story of Ruth, because Ruth is expecting for the boom to be lowered, for the boot to be given, and when she meets Boaz, his very first words to her are, I'm glad you're here. This is my field. You can stay in it. If you're thirsty, hey, there's something to drink. If you're hungry, there's food left over. Hey, the guys who are here, they're not here to harm you. I've told my guys to protect you, to watch over you, to help provide for you. I wanna show you my field. Whatever's out here, if you'll just work behind them, it's all yours. It's all yours. We're not slaves. Most of us aren't wondering where the next meal is coming from. But wow, this sounds amazing. Do you know how amazing it is? This thing has God's fingerprints all over it. Because if Boaz invited Ruth to belong, and that was her saving grace, I see God giving you and I the exact same invitation that we are people, none of who could stand in the presence of a holy and loving God. And he takes us in our sin. He doesn't wait for you and I to get cleaned up to say you belong. In his deep love for us, he takes our brokenness, he takes our sinfulness, he takes our shame, he takes our fear, he takes our insecurities, he takes our guilt, and he doesn't lead with, you've been a bad person. He leads with, hi, my name's God. I'm the one who made you. And I love you. You belong here. All that you see is mine. And I want you to enjoy it. You can have it. There's some things in this field that you need. All my provision, it's here for you. That's the offer that God makes you and I today. If Boaz's invitation to Ruth was her saving grace, then God's invitation for you and me to belong is our salvation. Our salvation through Jesus Christ. God isn't condemning. He's offering grace, something we don't deserve, exemplified through kind words and an invitation, and he invites us to belong. That's how hope rises, an invitation to something better. And that's what God does for each and every one of us. And so if, if you're living apart from God, what I wanna let you know is, man, hope is here for you because God is inviting you to step out of and step into his love. He's inviting you to know 
know his salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And today, what I would tell you is if you showed up and you're not real excited about your circumstances and you've forgotten how good God is, we're inviting you to receive from the Holy Spirit to know how good God's invitation is. And let me tell you how good Boaz's invitation was. It was so amazing It was so life-giving, Ruth couldn't form a word, but do you know what she could do? She could drop with her face to the ground and all she could could get out is, "Thank thank you, 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 followed by, I don't know what I did today to deserve this type of offer, but thanks be to God and thanks be to you. That was her response. Face down, thanks be to God, thanks be to you. If you want to know what the proper response is to God's invitation to know him and partake in his love, we see it in Ruth. It is face down. God, I don't know what I did today to deserve an invitation to know you, to belong to you, but thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, because without you, this is who I am, and it doesn't add up, and Lord, are you sure you want to offer this to me? And he does. And the only proper response is face down. God, thank you for loving me for meeting my emotional needs, my spiritual needs, my physical needs. He takes care of all of it. How's hope rise? With an invitation to belong. And listen, we all wanna belong. How bad do we wanna belong? I'll tell you how bad. It might sound silly, but you dress a certain way so that you can belong to a group of people. You talk a certain way because you want to belong. Your hobbies, you like your hobbies because you like them, but you also want to belong with God. He just says, because of who I am. Not because of anything that you've done, because I don't want anybody to boast about that. Because of who I am. You belong. Oh my goodness. Lord God, thank you, thank you, thank you that you would include me in your love. That's the proper response. That's how hope rises. Which leads us to the third thing. It's a cliffhanger on some level because Ruth has to, she gets to either accept or reject his invitation. And that's the beauty about God is he extends himself to us, but he allows us to accept or reject. Reject. Well, we see that Ruth receives an invitation. And again, I told you that Ruth is a redemptive story with a foreshadowing of things to come, a foreshadowing of Jesus to come, a foreshadowing of God's love to include all people. And if you look at the new, so here's what I would say. I would start with Ruth. If you see in Ruth chapter 2, Boaz invites Ruth to eat at his table. What analogies did Jesus use in the New Testament Jesus spoke over and over about a banquet, about a feast, about inviting people to the table. What is happening in this period of history, thousands of years before Jesus, is a foreshadowing that God was thinking of you and inviting you to be where he is and to eat at his table. And if you notice, Ruth ate more than she could have, and there was some left over. She had more than enough. She had more than enough. And so what I love about Ruth, which just speaks to her character, rather than saying, I'm done, she packed up what she had been given, and she was going to bring it home to Naomi. Talks about her character. Wow. That was awesome. But we also see in the story that Ruth gleaned an epha, not really something we use to as measurement tools in our culture. But an ephah equated to 35 pounds. Put it this way, Ruth was doing CrossFit before CrossFit existed. Because when that woman, however far she had to go from home, had to drag home 35 pounds of grain. That's what she's carrying that home. She had more than she could have ever needed or possibly used because she received the invitation. And here's where it all comes together for us. 
In the same way that God provided for Ruth, God provides for us. And that if you have God, you have more than enough. You see, you woke up this morning. You see, we live in a world that advertises us to tell us that we never have enough, that something's missing in our lives. But the story of Ruth is reminding us this morning, if we receive his invitation through Jesus Christ, we have more than we could ever possibly use. We have more than enough. There is no way that Ruth could have used all that. Man, listen, hope's rising. They could sell that. They could sell that to buy oil, to buy more food. They could, they could sell that to make some money so they could go buy some, some cloth for clothes and whatever. God's provision always exceeds our circumstances. And what I would tell you is we all got circumstances. And if your circumstances are broken this morning, what I would tell you is God is healing for you and he is more than enough if you walked in here this morning without hope what I would tell you is God is more than enough he is hope that is bigger than our circumstances it will receive his invitation and he wants to extend it to you this morning if you find yourself and you wake up you woke up fatherless You feel like an orphan. There is a heavenly father that is the best example for all of us earthly fathers to follow and how he cares for and he loves. And you have a heavenly father. You have not been orphaned. You have a God, the creator of all things, the creator of the universe, who's father to you, who loves you. And what I would tell you is he is more than enough. And because of that, hope rises. In Ruth chapter 2, we see hope being future-oriented. We see it being life-giving, and we see it contagious. You remember in Ruth chapter 1 that Ruth left her homeland and her people and her gods because she saw something special about Naomi? Well, in Ruth chapter 2, it's a complete role reversal. Naomi begins to hope again because of how God has provided for her through Ruth. Meaning, if you have hope in a relationship with God through his son Jesus, that hope will not only affect you, it'll affect and impact those that you love, those that you work with, as you speak of and as you share of his good love for you. Today, here's what I'm inviting each and every one of you to do. Each and every one of you. If God ordered your steps for some of you, what that means, if he's getting you where you need to be, man, he's getting you there for a reason. For some of us today, that means it's time to step into a relationship with him and receive that invitation. But for others of us who have just kind of been going through the whole hum of what we think it means to be a follower of Jesus, and we're just trying to go through, we're just actually going through the motions, really what I would tell you is God's got you here today for a reason, to remind you of the hope that is available to you in knowing him. You walked in here not feeling like you had much, but you've been reminded today through his spirit speaking to you that you have more than enough, that you are more than conquerors in him, and I want you to live in that truth. That's why God purchased our freedom. And so hope rises through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would all step into that. Will you pray with me? Lord God, thank you so much for my friends who are here today. I thank you for your servant, Ruth. I thank you for including us in your plans, Father. God, I want to just say thanks so much for ordering our steps in such a way that you get us where you need us to be. God, I want to say thanks for inviting us to belong, and I want to say thank you for being more than enough. Lord, I know that our circumstances are going to change, but help us keep our eyes and our hearts and our minds fixed on you, because from that place is hope. Thank you for your son, Jesus. We love you, God. In your name we pray. Amen.